welcome. You guys quiet down quick. Thank you. Welcome to our first keynote of, our, of the first week of our poetry festival here at the Fine Arts Work Center. We're really glad to see you. We're glad to have people back in the common room after three long years, so welcome. To celebrate, I can't think of a better way to celebrate that milestone, milestone if only I could speak, uh, by uh, welcoming Vivi Francis to the stage. Uh, she's teaching a workshop this week called And I Think to Myself, What a Wonderful World, Eco-Poetry, The Pastoral, and a Walk in the Wildwood. Vivi Francis is the author of The Shared World, forthcoming from Northwestern University Press, Forest Primeval in 2015, Horse in the Dark in 2012, and Blue Tail Fly in 2006. In 2009, she received a Rona Jaffe Writers Award and in 2010, a Kresge Fellowship. She is the recipient of the 2021 Aiken Taylor Award for Modern American Poetry. She serves as an associate editor of Callaloo and an associate professor of English and creative writing at Dartmouth College. Muzzle Magazine praised the simple exploration of her poetry, calling them deceptively simple, childish, yet profound. Her readers describe her poems as provocative and intimate and appreciate the honesty and curiosity of the speaker. We are so honored and pleased to welcome Vivi Francis to the Work Center. Please join me in welcoming, to the, to welcoming her to the stage. Vivi Francis. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. It is so wonderful to be back here. And oh, the wait has been so long. Um, so I, I want to thank Sharon and uh, David and Sarah and everyone. I'll say everyone's name at the end. I'm going to jump in because um, I've timed this and I want to make sure I get everything in. I'm opening um, this with three epigraphs the first from Amanda Gorman, how could catastrophe prevail over us? The second, Walt Whitman, I celebrate myself and sing myself and what I assume you shall assume for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. And Paul Lawrence Dunbar, why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. Well, we have all been masked for the last two and a half, three years. And that's a lonely place to be. We've been distant from each other. And I believe in this time away, there are these different kinds of awaynesses. We're really going inside. We're searching ourselves. We're getting the time, actually, to think about who we are and the importance of ourselves. I title this talk, The Personal I or Our Lives Matter. One, while we generally understand the term confession to mean the disclosure of something we find shameful or that we might find wrong, and it may seem as if many poets confess these days, I find that just as many, perhaps more writers, feel a distaste for personal disclosure in their work. Are the poets willing to speak about themselves? Sometimes, to some extent. A bit of revelation? Yes, here or there. But the kind of disclosure that pushes back against accepted and expected cultural assumptions from the inside or the outside, not so much. Today, I want to state that I have come to utilize and understand the value of personal disclosure in my work after years of writing persona poems. I did not start with my I, the I I am attached to, the I I am so personally invested in, though my I was always there, compelling me to imbue so many of the speakers in my persona poems with aspects of my own personality. Howling Wolf, that's me. His guitar, that's me too. 
but I could not face my eye directly. I did not want to draw upon my own life, which I found to be too painful. So I would cloak my eye in the position of, I have a greater concern for the world than for myself. And I did, but I was also wounded and in denial, believing the pain of others to be so much greater than my own. Even as my own pain buckled my knees, denial is a powerful drug. Two, the use of eye is cultural. Some groups have more access to the eye than others. I am considering Kundera's essay on the provincialism of small and large nations. The small nation may insist upon a collective voice. The larger nation may be able to afford the individualism of its citizens or not. Even so, where individualism is allowed, it carries its limitations. In the nation of poetry, try unseating the staid ideas of the muse. No, really, try it. Try questioning the received beliefs in our field that are embedded in Say that was embedded in gender assumptions and see how quickly the mouthy individual is dismissed. Discuss lineage outside of culture. Discuss your anguish over the received beliefs and how it bends your eye into a small self. Your poetry may be dismissed as political. Your lyrics become harder to hear, less musical or too musical. It took years for me to value the personal I. It is of great amusement, bemusement, and sometimes anger that the same writers who avoid the personal I in their poetry cannot be noting every moment of their lives on social media. <laughs> they want to be friended and followed and tagged. And when I question them about this, they inevitably say, oh, I only use it for poetry business or I've been meaning to get off of Facebook. Uh-huh, mm -hmm. Can we admit, my friends, that the impulse towards disclosure, to be known, to be understood, to be heard, to be seen is a natural one, a human one, and a shared one. Three, several reasons are given by writers for their bent against confession. These reasons may depend upon culture, gender, region, and the anxiety of influence and common but fallacious ideas around intellectualism, false humility, self-defeating fear, and perhaps most egregious, not understanding what is at stake when the I is erased. I'd like to address one or two of the reasons I just listed, if you will. My tendency is to offer up an anecdote or two to illustrate my points, personal stories. I shall play devil's advocate. So let's say I was asking you to confess to allow more vulnerability than you are accustomed to, to consider the deeply personal as powerful and the act of confession as inevitably political. So what? What if we do imbue our work with our memories, our stories, our re our reality as we understand it? That's right. So what? Why can't we do this? Should we assume because the events which are ours secreted away inside the chambers of our hearts and if the heart sounds too sentimental, then say gut, okay, secreted away in our gut. Should we assume because the events which are ours, the worlds that inhabit us literally revolving within the miniature galaxies of experiences will explode from our rib cages if we feel them? We tend to parse the knowledge of ourselves out to those we believe will care, relatives, friends, lovers, more to some, less to others, the trusted. We believe only those who care for us could possibly care about the various aspects of our personal lives. We believe this so thoroughly that we are unable to discern the aspects of our experiences that are relatable from those that aren't. Perhaps this is why we wind up on Facebook spilling out the detritus of every moment. On this note, there are two people in my life right now with utterly riveting Every time they reveal parts of their story to me, I want to sit down on a little mat in front of them like a child at story time. I grow big-eyed with wonder. And every time I beg them to stop writing for just a moment in other genres and commit to getting that story down, they say, oh, that's not so much. Uh, I'm not that interesting. I'm well-respected. 
I have the ear of some notable writers who call me for advice, who send me their work. But all discernment is lost in our fear of truer revelation. It is natural to feel one's own experiences as pedestrian or common, but no one's life is unnuanced. The question and challenge for writers is recognizing the complexities of our own lives, understanding our own impulses, and relating them not for sophistic affirmation, but for relatability to and for our readers. In other words, we must interrogate our own experience as humans if we want to lay claim to the experiences of others in our work, even if that other is in the imagination. Without the ability to step back and view our own experiences within the web of the human frame, to dismiss our own experiences is the opposite of humility. It is a learned and accepted humility that leads most often to the hubris of, I write for those who are voiceless, or I write the stories of those people over there, or the particularly insidious, the stories of others matter so much more than my own. So let me note here again that everyone's story matters. And by story, I mean our set of life experiences as interpreted by us and lived by us. And that should be inscribed by us if we mean to investigate, analyze, and inscribe the lives of others. Are there eras in history when some stories must be put forward, must indeed demand our engagement? Yes, absolutely. Those of us under 55, those of us 55 and under are particularly feeling the zeitgeist of that now. Four, my dear friend, and this is no exaggeration as my friend is dear because he and I have been placed together in some ordinary and extraordinary and rarefied situations that have sealed our connection to each other even when we fight, grow silent, take each other for granted or grab hands in a moment when the world is too large for us. So I say again, my dear friend <laughs> won a Pulitzer Prize for poetry. He would be identified as black, though he has the mind to note the fluidity of such assignations over time within African American culture. He is male. After the win, I was called by a newspaper journalist from his hometown who wanted to discuss what I thought his win meant. He was only the third black to win the prize and it, uh, the only the third black person to win the prize in its history and only the second for poetry only two are alive the conversation was moving along swimmingly happy really so overjoyed i couldn't get a hold on my emotions already being quite an emotional creature again happy to be talking about him i was not expecting the question that i should have guessed would inevitably come to paraphrase why does this book matter in light of the threats to black men and the deaths of so many by police brutality? This question rests upon a certain set of assumptions. The first being that if you are of a culture, particularly if you are not white, since white has long been the publishing reading normative, then you are expected by American publishers and editors to write placing race forward. Now, before you assume that this question was asked because the journalist was young and white and female, let me quickly note this assumption moves across the cultural board. This is what is expected by almost everyone over too many years. The assumption resting under that assumption is that work written by blacks should easily reflect that. And that assumption hides yet another, that what is black I would like to posit that what is black is not known. Stay with me for a moment. That it is historically framed with all of the baggage the world holds and discussed with a kind of hubris that makes me wince in its narrow measures, which have been generally urban and northern since the Harlem Renaissance. But much of the work of those of African descent in the Americas and in the Caribbean is collective. Not the I, but the we. So much so that I was leading a workshop, a week-long workshop at Oxford University a few years ago for Callaloo. And before me sat participants from all over the English-speaking African diaspora, the US, the UK, Trinidad, Jamaica. And when I discussed using the I, by which I meant allowing for the personal I, the intimate story of self, those lovely participants began to cry. Some had never felt free to tell their own stories because the prohibition of individual in collective cultures 
because of the prohibition of individualism in collective cultures. I'm glad I said that twice. Or cultures where ideas around collectivism dominate is so powerful, so penetrating, that even the thought of self causes guilt, shames, feelings of, but my story doesn't matter. Now this, this is not hubris. This is a genuine response to a set of values and teachings and beliefs that they were questioning at my insistence for the first time. African American culture is largely collective. This is in part a protective measure to push back against forces so overwhelming and inherent that it is politically understood and so often assumed without question that only a show of oneness can allow the kind of strength that can change laws. This is also in part because of a history that has stripped the self of ideas of selfhood so thoroughly that even considering it now can cause unconscious fear. Fear that we may act out act out of without even realizing that it's there. And that fear may show itself as an indifference to or denial of the importance of the personal story. Or that fear may be an adamant rejection of the personal and I don't want to reveal myself to anyone or everyone ever. Five, I am affectionate. I am round and soft for a reason by God. I have taken many into my arms and I have held many to say one thing. You have the right to tell your story, your story, your way. I am looking at all of you and aching to hold my arms out. Six, I was furious with that reporter. But was it her fault? Any reporter from any background who was raised in America would have asked the same thing. Perhaps any reporter world since America exports its assumptions. The reporter wanted to know how important was my friend's work given the Black Lives Matter movement, to which I said, it is easy to harm someone you don't know. If Black Lives Matter, don't we want to take the time to know what those lives entail? The details, the minutia, the grand moments, its detritus, its longings. My friend's book is just that the ordered litany of a catalog than a kaleidoscope of considered moments, mundane events, ideas, hopes, academics that allow the reader to move into the speaker's remarkably varied palette of life. The barrier between author and speaker in his poetry is a mere scheme. Now, I, I use that word, but now I want to change it. It's the th <laughs> I think that's the wrong word. It is the thinnest of membranes. And through our, our reading, we get to that life, that individual's life and all of its associated complexities. In this way, our assumptions, our stereotypes, the things we bring to the text are upturned. He doesn't bend to common assumption. He is a writer who dares see his own life within the larger web of human experience. And he understands that once that life is so inscribed, once we write our lives, it's no longer ours. That's the paradox. Writers, it is not enough to look outward. It is essential, even if we do not use our personal stories, to look inward. We must examine our lives to know what we may be dragging to our work inadvertently or to the reading of another's work. To understand and value our own moments is to be better able to see how another's moments might be valued. I said to the journalist, as I say to my classes, to write only external without attention to the internal, to write only the sum without attention to the parts is to shake an empty gourd. To say black lives matter and know nothing about a black life is empty. So what better text than the one that braves its disclosures with assuredness and sometimes a devastating vulnerability, powerful enough to make the reader rethink their own beliefs how apt that we can read some of his poems as black text, but others not easily or at all. His work carries its own cultural markers. All of us carry our own cultural markers in our work. Brooklyn, boy, indulgent father, family man, and all that implies, and so much more. And all of us are so much more. Seven. The poet Jack Riddle notes that through, though each story might differ in the details, we all are part of the collective of loneliness, pain, joy. That is where the relatability lies. So assuming no one cares about your personal story 
your eye is in some ways correct because once the story is told again, it is no longer personal. It immediately becomes collective. But in the writing, you as an individual must certainly be forwarded. The reader is reading to find themselves, to say, yes, I know, I know to say hush now to the hurt child within, to say fuck you to the bastard that brought them pain, to say love me, to say don't go, to say I'm here. Eight, because our personal is taken some extent <clears throat> is taken to some extent upon the reading, we are indeed generous to allow this. We are brave to allow this. That is how the eye works. Even if the eye of the speaker in a persona poem where the speaker is clearly not the author, see the collectivity as a set of shared human emotions upon reading that your eye will not prevent the reader from feeling if you attend to your craft, but as we do not exist in a vacuum, may actually act as a bridge toward feeling. Nine, there is a reason the will to confess exists. It is freeing, but only when the agency is ours. We alone must determine when and what and in what way or genre, and we have the right to write ourselves into our text. Or as the visionary Charles Rowell says, if I wanna write about the goddamn flowers, I'll write about the goddamn flowers. I add, if that flower is me, I write about me too. So many students generally from the East Coast, I'm sorry, and Midwest, generally female, I'm sorry again, um, and some having had fine educations. And I say generally because I hear this more from female poets than from male identified poets. So let me address that. Say, I don't use the I because it's not about me. I ask, okay, who is it about? And if it's not about you, why not? And since poetry in America has in the main for most of its history been dominated by men, and since women have fought hard to add leaves to the table at which we sit, why on earth is it not about you? Why self, why self erasure in a world that only recently acknowledged you? Women have not been deep in the field long enough to say, I don't write about the eye. Just asking. So many students believe their work will be viewed through a keener intellectual lens if they don't use the eye. So many students want to be seen that way as intellectually keen. And it is easier to mask a fear of the self or a fear of the repercussions of revealing one's own experience through cold abstraction, through clever obfuscation. It was courageous to confess in the late 1950s and early 1960s and it is as brave to confess now. Of course, little shocks us now, but I would like to suggest that sometimes we move toward the most shocking moments so no one asks what we're really hiding. We allow violence in our work to hide our wounding. We allow wounding to hide our rage. The real question is what is at stake if you, which I've put in quotation marks, if you are not there, if your eye is erased, what do you stand to lose? Who's telling you to lose that eye? Then ask, what do they stand to gain? Thank you. I love questions. I have thought about it, but it needs more work. So you all are my guinea pigs. Thank you. <laughs> I've been thinking about this for um, a very long time, and there are about ten iterations. But I believe what I'm saying. Um, yeah, and I, I find the I in work. Well, I agree with Jack Riddle. It's what's relatable is are the feelings that are drawn off by the story. And our personal stories, we're in a world where we don't exist in a vacuum. So I, I don't need a story of horror, but I don't mind a story of horror. And so the story, writing the mundane, 
is one of the most moving things you can do. So if you feel your life, oh, it's mundane, I'm gonna really push back and question that. I've never met someone whose life was just mundane. But I want to walk through the world with people. Um, that's why I like Frank O'Hara. I like walking down the sidewalk with him and just his observations. It can be as simple as that. And it doesn't have to be a giant reveal. Oh, yes. Um, thank you. Um, I'm curious, did this uh, willingness to be, speak from the eye come naturally for you, or did you have to overcome your own sort of self-censorship at some point? Where did that happen in your own development? Oh, that, thank you for that question. So um, I know I was rushing through. I didn't want to break the time thing. But um, so I know that I spent my first almost two decades of writing, writing persona poems. Um, and not writing persona poems because I, because you use the I in persona, you become that person. But I couldn't face my own life. I had uh, childhood wounding and it took several years for me to write the second book where I just kind of put my toe in the water about personal experience. And then the third book, it was just out there. Like, this is what I feel all of the time. <laughs> and my feelings are all over the map. Follow me, you know. <laughs> it was just Alice falling down the rabbit hole of the self. But um, I learned so much about myself. But the process took years. And I had a little help. Um, the poet, to him, the Jess and I, um, we were in a workshop quite like this. And it was called Callaloo. We spent two weeks in small classes of 10. And he looked at my work one day, and it, it was all in third person. And he said, is that you? <laughs> just harsh, just harsh. He's gentle now. But back then, harsh and bourbon. There we go. So is that you? And I said, yes. So that's your experience. And I said, yes. And he called me out. Why aren't you saying it that way? But I couldn't say it that way. I didn't have the emotional strength at the time to do that, nor did I have the skill. It took a while to close the skill gap and to... Have you ever heard a song on the radio and you have to turn it off because it makes you cry? Mm -hmm. That's what happened every time I wanted to go into my eye, and I believe that's what happens to many people when they turn there. And that point at which... You no, that's the point at which I want people to go, right? Trained myself to do that over time. I still love persona poems, though. Give me some Robert Browning. Give me some I. And that I, AI, the poet I. Yeah. <laughs> Another question? Yes. Um, I'm curious if there are generational um, differences that you notice in a willingness to use an I, uh, and uh, I'll say this as a 35-year-old, um, and maybe wondering how millennial this is, to feel that I comes easily. Mm, and so mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. and, and wanting to wonder, you know, what's, what's there? <laughs> you know, what's there about that? And, and I mm -hmm. guess, yeah, actually, maybe I'll stop there. Another great question, and this is how I feel about it personally. Um, when I first started talking about this, I was actually much younger, and no one around me was saying it, or I was getting a lot of pushback. So the millennials have saved my life. <laughs> the millennials with this radical attention to identity, thank you, because it forces me to explore myself. And it forces me to address things about myself, right? So I, I find that to be wonderful. Um, and, and then there's poetry in America. So you'll have a movement, say, you know, confessionalism. You'll have a group doing that. Then the next generation or the one right behind that is going to push back. No, oh, I don't want to spill my, look at those guts on the floor. Oh, I don't want that, right? <laughs> But now confessionalism, it's broader, and it's a part 
of American writing in, in a way that it wasn't prior to that. So that movement kind of helps. And then I'm thinking about Ginsburg and his further push into the personal life and I, the I. Um, and it, moving further through uh, spoken word, spoken word uses the I quite right? But again, you have pushback, especially in the academy, especially among uh, the professors who are teaching poetry. So which is why I say when someone says, lose your I, I can pretty much guess who they are, what generation they are. No, don't lose your eye, and that's told to women more than anybody else. And women in the academy will, and especially on the East Coast, right, um, this, these fine academies, they aren't pushing back because they don't know that they can, right? So again, with the millennials and the culture of our times right now, I think it's helping with that, but only helping a little, because I still get a lot of students telling me that their lives don't matter. And which is why I wrote Our Lives Matter. And, and I think they matter on the page. So I don't know if I answered your question, but. I'm, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm curious when people venture into I land for the first time, mm -hmm. how, um, do you have any advice for orienting to that landscape in a way that keeps the poem open to people who are reading it? Well, first I'm, I'm wondering how the poem would be closed, right? Um, so if they're, if they're starting to write the story, you don't have to write the entire story, right? You don't have to write a memoir in one poem, right? So these experiences that are written in the poem can be smaller, a moment in time, but it was your moment in time, right? I do suggest for people who are not used to writing themselves, for whom it becomes very emotional and overwhelming, I like to stay safe when I write. So when I go into the cave of the self, I always have something to bring me out. Sometimes it's my husband, right? Bunny, <laughs> what are you doing? You know, okay. Sometimes I just, oh Lord, did I just tell you he calls me Bunny? Is he in here? <laughs> oh no, okay. Oh, he's here. Oh, okay. Um, and sometimes, uh, as with, you know, I keep chocolate on, um, desk and sometimes in my pockets maybe now there's a tiny snickers um, <laughs> um it, it feels so harry potter like the dementors this is how you fight them with chocolate but it's not before the dementors i had the chocolate um or i call my friend trish um and we talk about something else i have to know before i go in and i suggest poets know if they're not used to this to make sure they have a time limit too I really don't write those pieces more than 20 minutes at a time. That's my personal limit. If I go more than 20 minutes, I'm gonna cry. And I can write through tears. I don't have a problem with that. But sometimes those tears are telling me it's time to rest and have a, spa a bit of space before I go back in again. So I do personally believe that going into the wilderness of the self truly takes um, bravery and you have to have a way out of the maze something waiting for you even a cup of tea so that sounds strange but it works and it keeps uh, many of my friends and students and workshop participants safe okay I'm just going all over the place now I'm just talking about everything just confessing at will. <laughs> <laughs> Any other question I might have missed? Oh, is there, okay. I, I don't have a question, I just wanted to say it's such a, I'm finding it such a bomb to hear you, B-A-L-M, bomb to hear you saying how how 
both terrifying it can be to go into the self. Yes. That that moment of you know the radio, the song and that mm -hmm. feeling is is mm -hmm. so res uh, resonates with me so much. But then also that that how empowering it is and it's how it it is something that is so. Just hearing from you that all of our stories are worthwhile or we're we're worthy of of sharing our stories. That's really. I love that message, so thank you for that. They absolutely are, and oh, I want to ask, do I have time for one poem? Okay. So, in this poem, I intend to put my money where my mouth is, and this is, um, oh, let's see. I just had it in my hands, excuse me. Here it is. My mother passed away um, four years ago. I'm still grieving, but I'm not crying. I've worn it three days in a row. The dress my mother died in, no, the dress I was wearing when my mother died. And I took pictures of myself, self, no, of the dress, of my legs curled tight under the dress, only my ankles and feet showing. I held my arm up and back and did not want to show my head, my swollen eyes and chapped lips and all that dried salt on my face, my face. She could not bear to look at unless it was with disgust. My hair, never good, no good, and my unironed dress, this one, I am wearing now with its white cotton underslip and its red embroidered paisley upon a white background. It is beautiful, even with me in it. Yes, I am not wearing a hat. She said, you look so ugly in that hat. It was my favorite one of three hats. She had more than 100 stored in her basement in labeled boxes. They were her particular thing. Every Sunday, a new one, perched proudly as a bird of paradise, though only the males are so presentable. But she was a tomboy once, and so was her mother. She hated my teacups and my dollies that I couldn't sleep without, like I slept that day when I found out she had died. I lay fetal upon the bed atop the duvet and wanted to live and felt guilt like a razor over the wrist. You always were odd and carrying on. You talk too much. You're a mess, and I was a mess. Chest wet and my heart shrinking in, and I was shrinking, and this was good. She was always a small woman, except for 10 years when she grew past what her small frame could hold. Who can say why her hunger grew and why she hated my hunger to be held and so recoiled? And I went days and days without any touch at all, and I have gone days and days since ugly in my hat. Even my father thought so, though now he isn't sure. Since she died, so much has changed. Even this dress, now stained by wear and coffee and crying, and now the pills won't let me, and now and again sleeping in it. And just last night, keeping it on for dinner alone at the same counter where I was when I found out she had died a few minutes after our last phone call, when she couldn't see me and so could afford to love me. Vivi knows how to kick off a poetry week. That's for sure. Thank you, Vivi. That was wonderful. I will remind everybody that Vivi, if she doesn't mind, will be signing her books, which you can buy at the back of the room for a little bit. Um, we have two more faculty events on Monday and Tuesday. I hope you'll join us. They're at 6 p.m. here in the Common Room. They're free and open to the public. What else was I supposed to? There was something else. I forget. Anyway, there's a and there's a box dinner waiting for you outside. I hope you'll join us and en enjoy the food. Yes, and you won't be hungry for long. <laughs> Thank you. We're off to a great start. Thank you, Vivi Francis. Thank you.